Good evening, everyone. So I'm Laurie Bryan. And I'm Beth Waddell. And Laurie and I both teach English to speakers of other languages here at BCC. And this semester, we've been using this book by T. Boy, the best we could do in our classes. And, and uh, we were really surprised when we found out that T actually lives in Berkeley. <laughs> we didn't know that at first. And she was one of the founding members of Oakland International High School. And she's also on the faculty of California College of the Arts uh, in the MFA program in comics. So uh, we were really thrilled when she accepted our invitation to come tonight. She just had a meeting with our students and um, she also offered to do this public lecture. And we would also like to thank the Jerry Adams Foundation, or sorry, Jerry Adams Endowment Fund here at Berkeley City College, which funds social justice related activities, and especially Joan Berezin, who helped us a lot. So now I'd like to introduce uh, the person who's going to introduce T. And this is Alicia Gonzalez. Alicia is an advanced student in the ESL program at Berkeley City College. She's a philosophy major. And also, she was a student of Tibui's at Oakland International High School. So, Alicia? As what Ms. Lori just said, um, I'm Alicia Gonzalez, and I'm going to introduce Ms. T. Oh, I call her Ms. T because she used to be my teacher a long time ago. Okay. T. Bui was born in Vietnam three months before the end of the Vietnam War and came to the United States in 1978 as part of the boat people, wave of refugees from Southeast Asia. T. taught high school. T. taught high school in New York City and was a founding teacher of, of Oakland International High School, the first public high school in California for recent immigrants and English learners. T taught my class and me in 2013 how to write our own stories. We learned how to write our own stories and I actually did um, my book, tiny book, just like hers, comic book. And I think I still have it, but I have it at home. I didn't bring it. Um, she currently teaches in MFA in comic Pro, in comic programs at the California College of Arts. She lives in Berkeley with her son, her husband, and her mother. And um, I'm very happy here to introduce her because uh, she was one of my the teachers that inspired me a lot. And I'm actually writing a book, but pretty different than hers. But I really love doing comic books and it's pretty hard, I think. And now it's TV. Thank you so much. It's um, this is my kind of crowd. <laughs> I'm I don't usually get to um, you know, travel around and talk about my book to nice audiences of adults. Um, I've been a public school teacher for the last ten years, <clears throat> which means uh, there are usually bells ringing at me and. Um, you know, usually 40 different people needing something from me. And um, if this was a high school audience, maybe half of you would be on your phones and uh, falling asleep on me. So thank you very much uh, for this lovely life as a writer. <clears throat> but uh, it is wonderful to get to see when your students um, leave you and turn into adults and, uh, um, and, and just really wonderful people. Some of the students that I had um, from my first year of teaching in New York City are now in their mid to late 20s, because um, I had them when they were freshmen in high school, and they're amazing adults and read books, and um, it's the best reward for a teacher to get to see um, you know, the fruits of your labor, sometimes many years later. 
So um, <clears throat> this is also a project that took uh, about 10, 12 years, um, mostly because I was doing it on holidays and weekends when I wasn't teaching or raising my son. Um, I call up my second kid and I would, I'm happy to answer lots of questions about it, even though we already had a Q&A here with a class that read it. Um, but first, I, I would like to try to entertain you a little tonight. Um, and I have some lovely volunteers who have volunteered to help me. Um, I want to give you a little context first. Am I being double mic'd, actually? All right, is this good on this mic? Great. Um, okay, so um, in January, I did a short piece uh, that went online as part of... Um, a group of comics for PEN America, they called it State of Emergency. Um, they asked artists to respond to what was happening in the country uh, since the election. Many people were having very strong feelings about a changing America and what that meant for um, uh, different groups, including immigrants and refugees. So I did this piece called uh, Precious Time. Um, there's nothing like losing your family, your country when you're little to see nationalism as the strange and unnatural thing that it is. When I was, when I was three, uh, I'll just tell you the story. My family packed us into the cargo hold of a riverboat and set out to sea. Uh, in 1978, uh, we, we settled in Indiana, and I grew up wondering whether I was Vietnamese or American, and actually wasted a lot of my youth, I think, trying to figure that out, because actually, I'm just a jumble of all of those things. Um, but it's helped me to see uh, not borders, not people divided up into borders and countries, but just to see humans as humans, and humans who need help are humans who should be helped. But uh, we're at a strange time when um, some people are hoarding a lot of the resources and there are conflicts causing upheaval in the world and uh, people are losing their minds. So we are entering a time when we humans are going to be wasting a lot of precious time and resources fighting over who gets what. But as... Um, this image of this little boy named Alan uh, reminds us our decisions down here on Earth do matter. Um, this image, uh, it makes me feel a little uncomfortable to use it, but I felt strongly um, about using it because uh, this little boy was three years old when his family packed him into a boat and tried to find a safer place for him. Um, and that was the same age that I was when my family packed me into a boat to try to find a safer place for me. And I made it, and he didn't. And that is a very painful and arbitrary thing to have happened. Um, so I uh, do whatever I can these days to try to prevent um, tragedies from happening to people who just need a little help. <clears throat> So I'm going to take you back now to uh, 1978, when I was three years old. Um, we are in a refugee camp in Malaysia. Um, if you haven't read the book yet, I spend, uh, there are ten chapters in the book, and I spend seven chapters having you get to know them as people. They're just to me, my mother, my father, my two sisters, my brother, and me, um, before they ever become refugees. But because we've been talking about refugees, I'm just going to drop you into the scene where we become uh, known as the boat people and uh, give you a little taste of what that experience was like for uh, my parents and then also from the point of view of my sisters who were just children at the time. In March of 1978, when we arrived at Pulau Besar, there were already 3,000 people in the camp. Every week, a delegation came from a different country. France, Canada, Australia, the US, to interview people wanting to resettle there. Oh. 
go to the Who do we know, their talk? Any choice was a gamble. My parents decided our futures on very little information. You already have two sisters in America. And we know a little English. Maybe, maybe we could teach French in America. For children, camp was in many ways a wonderful vacation. No school. Let's watch the ladies die for self shellfish. We are not weren't there my dad? Yeah. Kind of practice floating. An escape from regular life. Beach from Aurora School, is that you? Guys, you. <laughs> what are you doing here? And why are you still wearing our old school uniform? My family just arrived. They didn't tell me where we were going. They just picked me up from school one day. And now I'm here. Can I have a little privacy, please? For Ma, there was the worry of how to have and care for a newborn baby in a refugee camp. You speak wonderful French, madame. Surely someone like you has other resources? Ma was so humiliated by having to beg and so upset at having her honesty questioned. She went into labor that evening. And there's still no um, diapers. Hold on, sis. Herm. Ah! <laughs> 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 It's <laughs> great. The struggle to bring a life into the world is rewarded by that cry. It is a single minded effort, uncluttered and clear in its objective. What follows afterward, that is, the rest of that child's life, is another story. Daily life was not easy. Water came out of ditches dug by previous residents and had to be boiled before drinking. Wood for boiling and cooking had to be gathered from the dwindling forest surrounding the camp. There were no proper toilets. Bo would take us a little further out each day to relieve ourselves and bring back firewood. Yet we were among the lucky ones. Our stay there was only a few months. That's us. On the other side of the world, Ma's older sister Dao and her husband acted as our US sponsors and processed all our paperwork quickly. The Red Cross helped us get our plane tickets and my parents promised to repay them once they had jobs. In Kuala Lumpur, we got our immunizations and our health cleared. Ah. Ah. Ow, ouch. <laughs> All except for Bo. There was a scar on your lung, X-ray. You need to stay so we can take a closer look. How long? My family leaves tomorrow. I don't know. Well, have to wait and see. They said their goodbyes at the church where we slept. I borrowed 30 dollars from an old student back at camp. I used some of it to buy new outfits for the kids. We don't need uh, much else. Take this for your trip. And then the next morning, 
Does anyone here speak English? A little. That's great. We needed you to, to help this group get to where they are going. But I have four children. Don't worry. My wife and I can watch uh, your kids. There were about a hundred people who needed Ma to show them to their gates, help them check in, and fill out forms. We sat with the elderly couple, absorbed by the Hershey bar that Ma had bought for us. Finally, it's time for us to get it the prayer. The flight attendant gave Ma a bassinet for the baby, but he cried every time she tried to put him down. She had only one cloth diaper for him, so every time he peed, <clears throat> she wiped him with napkins and folded the cloth to move the wet spots. Just don't poop, okay? My sisters and I got an airplane pin and juice, which kept us content. Then the chaos of getting in and out of Los Angeles. Customs, baggage, connecting flights. You go to gate seven over there. Holly, they are calling your flight. You go to uh, Terminal 3, follow the signs. You go to gate 7, over there, hurry, they are calling your flight. Wait, which way? Did you say miss? We're scared, we'll get lost. No, please miss, take us there. After helping everyone else, Ma realized, Oh no, our flight's about to leave. Finally, on June 28th, 1978, we arrived at Chicago O'Hare Airport. Ma's sister Dow and one of her daughters were there to meet us. Welcome to America. Meanwhile, back in Kuala Lumpur, you have scars from tuberculosis, but no infection. You are clear to go. Kuala Lumpur Airport, like Ma, Mo was called upon to use his limited English to help the other refugees traveling. Listening, there has been an airline strike. We had to get you our new tickets. In Los Angeles, distracted by the needs of others, Mo actually did miss his own flight. No. What do I do? Through broken English, a lot of gesturing, and eventually a supervisor who spoke French, Paul got on a late flight to Anchorage, Alaska. He spent his first night in America on a bench in the airport. Bo's attempts to call Ma's sister on a payphone were unsuccessful. His experience in Los Angeles left him too nervous to leave his waiting area to go buy food. When he finally arrived at Chicago O'Hare Airport, his belly was as empty as his morale was low. Excuse me, are you from Vietnam? Yes. Excuse me, are you from Vietnam yet? Tom Rivers from U.S. Calholic, Charities. I come out here every day to see if there are any refugees arriving? Where are you going? Unbelievable, I know that man. I go to his house every day for a bowl of pizza pot. <laughs> Why is it so ugly here? Ha 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 ha, you don't like it? Hammond, Indiana, two hours later. Surprise! Oh my God. That night, we slept reunited under the same roof in a new country. Me, my baby brother, Bo, and Ma, and Lan, and Bit. 
in a two-bedroom house with my aunt, her husband, their five children, and one dog. Thank you. And thank you so much to the readers. That's my dad. <clears throat> Busting the grateful refugee uh, stereotype right from the get-go. Um, I thought I would just maybe open it up to questions again. Um, I sort of enjoy having a dialogue with the audience, especially one that's um, as well-versed in immigration stories as I ever could be. Um, I will say, um, for people who came in later, that I, um, this was never meant to be a memoir, because my story is not special at all. Uh, it's a very common experience amongst Vietnamese Americans, and that's maybe the reason why I wanted to tell it, is because even though it was so common, I hadn't seen it properly represented in media or literature that I grew up with, and definitely not any of the Vietnam War movies um, that Hollywood put out. <clears throat> so it was my, my little revenge against the Vietnam War movie. Yes, sir. Um, it's all drawn by hand uh, with brushes dipped in ink. So in that way, I was very traditional. But then I, um, in order to get that reddish color in the background to print cleanly, I had to um, either paint it on a separate piece of paper, which would have been a very blind process, or I could paint it digitally. So I chose the easier way, which to paint it was to paint it digitally. Um, but I really wanted it to feel hand done. So I have these textures from actual watercolors that I did, that I overlaid. So it, there's some Photoshop trickery <laughs> in there. Yes. Um, so I know that um, Vietnamese American, except for the younger generation, they had very hard time to communicate with the parents to get them to tell their story of the war and especially even their childhood. So it's kind of surprising for me when I read the book, and you can you even know your your parents trying to back into like the French colony time. So like. How do you do that? Or is just that like a trend like easier than like average? Yeah, I think they are. <laughs> the more people I talk to, the, the more I realize, wow, I really had access to a couple of talkers. Um, and so it's like, you know, it's like finding gold. Um, I had to do something with it. I grew up with their stories. I, so all I had to do is ask them more questions and, and better questions to get like more of their childhood stories. But um, they, they never hid anything from me. And so it's just, I, I was very lucky in that sense. And so hopefully I can be of use, useful then to other people who would like to know these histories, but their parents would prefer to move on. Um, I mean, some of the memories are painful for people and that's very understandable. But I do think that um, we're getting older and our parents' generation who lived through these experiences firsthand I don't want their stories to get lost. Yes. Are you Roberta? Hi. <laughs> the, the internet's free for meeting people. Yeah. Uh, so um, I'm wondering if you, uh, what sorts of um, creative plots did you encounter? Um, you know, how did you choose certain scenes in your life in this process as opposed to others? Um, how, how were you able to kind of, you know, figure out your, you know, your life story in such a, um, you know, well-structured um, way? Uh, thank you. It probably looks more structured than it is. <laughs> I, um, I had way more material than I could use, um, so I I think that's probably a really common thing. Um, so I, I, I try to think about it like a documentary filmmaker. So I was just like recording. I've been recording inter interviews and um, I have all these different stories that I couldn't fit into the book, but um, I needed to have all the material to look at so that I could 
see what the common threads were. And so it needed like, it needed certain themes to weave in and out and it needed a, like a, there were too many characters in the beginning. Uh, people were asked, someone asked me earlier a great question about what about my sisters and their perspective. So my sister's perspectives are very much in the book. Um, all of the stories about their experiences as kids comes from them. But if I had made the main characters too, I think it would have been too many characters for the reader to hold. Um, because it was important for me to really have you get to know the characters so that you could feel their ups and downs as if they were your own family. Um, so I had to narrow it down to my mother and my father. And then even then I needed to give you somebody that you could relate to. So I had to volunteer myself as the guide. Um, so then I had to get into my relationship with both of these main characters. So just thinking about the relationships um, forced me to really go deep into the issues. I thought that the issues a long time were just like going back and finding the origin story of my family. But when, as I got older and I was figuring out that the book was very much about um, parents and children, I found like a commonality between the story of my family and the story of Vietnam. So the story of Vietnam, as I see it in the 20th century, is this yearning for independence and self-determination, which um, was foiled by, the, by, the, by France coming back to try to reclaim its colony, and then a 10-year war to fight for independence, and then 30 years of civil war that got made worse by foreign interference. Um, so there was still all that time to struggle for independence, but um, at a very, very steep price. And then in a family, children are um, in a way waging war against their parents when they, when they try to become grown-ups, when they try to like assert their independence. Um, and there's a cost to that too. Um, so this is all very, this is all very abstract, right? But when you have like all of the material from your oral history there, you can just find the pieces to fit into those that big narrative arc, and then um, then it's a, then it just becomes a job of showing, not telling. So as much as I could talk about these things without ever saying big words like PTSD or or you know, I, I would my goal was always in every chapter like not not telling you the thing, but creating this elaborate story that hopefully would get you to say the thing that I wanted to say. <clears throat> I'm very jealous of people who write pop songs and can just say the thing that they want to say. <laughs> yes, in the back. Hi. Um, what, what advice would you give to the next generation of like Vietnamese American storytellers who want to connect with their parents? Like, um, the folks being born here or and, like their children? I was wondering, uh, what advice would you give to the next generation of Vietnamese American youth and storytellers who want to connect with their parents but don't know what the right questions would be to ask? Oh, um, so the right the right questions, boy. Um, hmm. Um, really uh, specific ones, like, um, you know, like you shouldn't, when you do an oral history, you, sh you, sh you should avoid asking people things that you can just look up in a history book. Um, and you should ask them about like their own experience of things. So for example, instead of like, um, who were the people fighting in the Vietnam War, you could say like, was anyone fighting in your family in the, during the war? Did, was, did, was anybody in the army? Who, which side were they on? What did they ever say about it? Um, so the more specific you can get about like what actually happened to them or how they felt about something, um, the more likely it is that they'll give you something unique. Um, and then like the more specific you can get about specific moments, um, the better the more information you have for writing or reconstructing that memory, 
So I would always like think about like my five senses. So like try to imagine like if it was hot or cold or if it was there was wind or if it was like smelled bad or if it was, you know, um, if the person was hungry um, or if their body ached. You can you can ask questions like that um, that help you just try to like create like a bridge between the reader and them. Um, what else? Um, allow for gray areas. You know, people don't like to be judged when, when they're telling you personal things about themselves, and I found that to be very, very important. So I had to um, find ways, because I was very judgmental of my mother in, in a lot of ways when I was interviewing her about her privileged childhood, um, and I realized that that was a, an obstacle for her to open up to me. And I realized that when she spoke to my husband in English, she told him a lot more. Um, and I think it was because also that she didn't assume that he knew anything, whereas she assumed that I knew a lot. So like, you know, just finding ways around people's uh, blocks really helps. Thank you. Yes. How did you, how did you create a book? How did you create the book? Like, uh, with which you started? Like, uh, story drawings. If you can describe how you create. Um, in the beginning, there was a lot of uh, drawing in my sketchbook, and then writing on the side. And it took a while for the two to come together more in the comics form. So later on, um, as I got more comfortable drawing in like panels, then I would draw two pages at a time very, very small, so I could plot out uh, um, like how many panels there would be, whether there would be a big establishing shot or some close-ups, and where the text would fall, so that there wouldn't be too much text on any page. And I could that way also plan like what, um, what the text would be in the final panel would be on the bottom right-hand side before you turn the page, and then, um, and these, draw these drawings are like maybe this big, and then I draw them a second time, maybe this big, and add the words and stuff. Um, and then that, I would send that to my editor and get feedback on whether they had questions, whether anything was confusing, and then I would redraw everything <laughs> a second time at that size. And then finally, when it was pretty much right, I would um, blow it up big and then like draw more prop more more detail on top of that. And then I would scan that and then print it out in blue, um, a light blue that then I would ink on top of with my brushes and then scan that and take away the blue in Photoshop and then add the final color. It's a very long process. <laughs> yes. Oh, I don't know. Did you point at me? Yes, I did. Um, I have a two-part question. Okay. Did your family, when you were interviewing them, did they know that you were planning to write a book? And was there resistance to making your personal story public? And then I guess the second part is, have they read the, your book and what was the reaction? Um, yes, it was always uh, it was always known to them that it was going to be a book. Um, the f when I first started interviewing them, it was for like my master's final project, um, and it wasn't intended for the public yet. But it was the first thing that my family ever got really really excited about that I did. Um, I had like done a lot of like art shows and things before that, and they were always very supportive. But this was the first thing that they were like excited about. So I thought, oh, okay, I have their blessing to be recording their stories. So then I asked them, well, I would like to actually turn it into a graphic novel. And I showed them some other ones that I thought was, that were really good. And they were always into it. Um, so I think that actually working on the book helped me have the difficult conversations with them because it, we sort of pretended that we weren't having these difficult co conversations. We were just working on the book. Um, and so uh, because it got pretty personal, I showed them every, every draft of every chapter before I sent it to the editors to make sure that they were okay with it. And there were some things that I changed, but mostly they didn't censor 
anything. They mostly gave me more information because the drawings helped them remember more. Um, so yes, they have read it and they're supportive. Um, I was telling people earlier, my mother says, well, this is T's version of our story. <laughs> um, but then she also says it's 99% true. So I think she, you know, I think, <laughs> I think we just have a, maybe a disagreement about like what is objective truth and like I see things more as well. It's hard to say what objective truth is when you're dealing with memories from a long time ago because even if like I asked you all to close your eyes now and tell me like what the color of the chairs and the walls were and how many windows there are and how many doors, you might not be able to actually rem remember that or you might all have a slightly different perception of how high the ceiling is and that's just like our the room that we're in. Um, relationships and uh, politics and families, family histories are a lot more complicated. So I think that, um, yeah, there are some conflicting uh, perspectives with just even within my family. Yes. Okay, uh, I want to know, um, what your feeling when you went back to Vietnam in first time? Because it's, I don't know, but with the Bo Ma language, it's a, it's, a, it's a time to go back hometown, but some were born in Malaysia with him. I think this is a visit a new country, but you, I think you are featuring of them, and I don't want to know your feeling that, at that time. Yeah, it was a really wild experience to go back. Um, I was 20, I was in my early 20s. So I was still like wondering, oh, is this my country that I'm going back to? Um, because I, I knew that I wasn't from here, but I felt pretty American. Um, so there were things that I, I felt like they were more natural to me, so just like the air felt better <laughs> to me. Like the, the humidity and the, the heat felt really good to my skin. So in some ways I felt like, oh, this is like natural to me. Um, and it felt really good to like just see a lot of people who looked like me. Um, on the other hand, um, I don't know, the, like just the popular culture and and the things that I have grown up reading here are like have also influenced me a lot. So I realized, oh, you know, this is not really my home anymore. It's like part of my history, but a home maybe is something more like a like a backpack that I carry around with me now. And um, then later on, in my later 20s, I just decided, no, I'm, this is my home, and I'm going to plant my roots here, which means that I have to do some work in this country to change attitudes about like who's a foreigner and who's an American. Um, but I will always see Vietnam as something special that I have a relationship with. But I, I think that maybe you have to put in you have to put in effort and time to build that relationship. So I, there's, I think there's more Vietnam in my future. Yes. Uh, I want to know the reason that you uh, did this novel. So is it uh, just uh, creative uh, or you want to share your experience, or you were looking for several uh, questions, so now uh, you feel comfortable when you did, when you achieved this uh, this job. So you feel more comfortable than before. Uh, I think I learned a lot more. The process of making the book was highly uncomfortable. <laughs> I cried a lot, um, and I w I worried a lot, and I, I sat too much. Um, it's a very lonely process working on a long comic book, um, like 12-hour days drawing. It's not very fun, um, but I, it was something that I needed to do for myself and my family, and um, I, I hoped. I worked really hard at making it accessible to lots of different kinds of readers um, because I wanted, it, I wanted to share this history with as many people as I could. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, I worked in a refugee camp for two years. 
So whatever we saw with the Excel uh, earlier, it is really true for many refugees ready to leave the camp. And like the first day when they arrived in America, uh, it's really good that you recall all the details about getting lost or you know, when you arrive. But my question for you is about how did you approach the publisher to get this one published? Did you have an agent or you work with an editor and you finished the, the whole book first then you approach them or you work with them uh, by stage or you, know, or you present to them an idea first and then you work from there? Um, most people have an agent before they p approach a publisher because they, there are a lot of gatekeepers in, in publishing and an agent helps you like just get your manuscript in the right hands. But I got very lucky. Um, have you heard of a, a book called Vietnam America by G.B. Tran? It, it's another graphic novel about the Vietnamese experience of the Vietnam War, and it's very good. And it came out right when I was at, right when I was starting my book, um, which made me feel like, oh, I should just quit. <laughs> Someone's already done it. Um, and I realized after wanting to kill this person who beat me to my goal, um, you know, I was thinking of that. There's a movie from the 80s called Highlander where I was like thinking, there can only be one. Um, uh, so I was a little bit embarrassed at my initial response and I, I found his, uh, I found GB, the author's email address and I emailed him. He was living in New York and I was living in California and um, he had a much better reaction to meeting me. So I, can, I, I, ta I talked him into doing a, a collaboration with me where we drew a comic together. I drew one page and he drew the other page and it was about meeting each other. So on my page I drew about like reading his book and you know going into despair and having the fantasy of going and doing a Highlander on him. And then he brought about um, just being very happy when he finished his book to learn that there was another Vietnamese American graphic novelist wanting to do, to do the same thing um, and welcoming me. <laughs> Um, so we published this together in uh, an Asian American magazine called Hyphen Magazine, and then um, uh, and it was an idea that I pitched to them. So I guess I did approach an editor, but it was just for a little magazine. And then a few months later, I got a message on LinkedIn of all places um, from Abrams, who is my publisher. So it was an editorial assistant, a young woman. I think she was. 24 years old or something at the time. She's a young Asian American woman in publishing, which is a pretty rare thing, um, looking for, for stories. Um, and she said, I'm interested in your story. Send me your work. So I sent her lots of chapters of early, early work, which was not very good. And she said that she liked the writing a lot. Um, but my art, not so much. <laughs> but if I was willing to... Um, work on my art to improve it, um, she would help me uh, propose it to her boss. And so I worked with her for about six months to get uh, 20 pages of like finished art and an outline for the whole book. Um, and they then they accepted it. And then it was a process of about two years of working with editors at the, at the publisher. Did you ever miss growing up in Vietnam than here in the U.S. as an immigrant? Did I ever mi miss Vietnam? Yeah, like miss uh, growing up there in Vietnam as uh, you're originally from Thailand than here in the U.S. as an immigrant. Yeah, I, th I think um, maybe because I was so young when I came as an immigrant, I only, had, I only knew Vietnam as an idea, but it was enough to make me feel that I was missing something. Um, so there's a picture in the book where I draw myself as a child with a hole in my chest. That's the shape of Vietnam, and that's how I, that's how it felt. There was a we had my family had a clock on the wall. That's the shape of Vietnam. I think a lot of Vietnamese families had this in their house, and it was an image that I had in my head that like always reminded me that this is where I was supposed to be, and I it, it felt like that was like a hole. There was a hole like that shape in, in my chest, and I could feel the wind blow sometimes. Um, but I think that that's maybe a common feeling when you live in just in a when you're displaced, 
um, and the country where you are sometimes makes you feel like you don't belong, there's an idea that maybe there's somewhere else that you were supposed to belong. And it takes going back when you're older to realize that was all a, a, a that was all in your head, um, and not necessarily the truth. I don't, I don't know. It's a difficult it's a difficult question to answer. Yes, but it must have taken so long before you settle here in the U.S. I know, like it took a long time, and I think it also took doing the book. I think that actually the book, you asked me earlier, what was the purpose of it? It was for many different things, but I think for myself it was a grieving process. Learning the history of Vietnam in more detail helped me see that it was on this trajectory where it became at a certain point incompatible with my parents, so that by the time I was born it wasn't really my country anymore. Um, and. I think le having to learn that history and write it down um, helped me with my grief for losing, I guess, losing a country. Yes. Uh, can you tell us uh, when you get your the first American uh, friend, like an uh, English speaker of your friend? My first American friends were other immigrants. <laughs> <laughs> they were nicer to me. <laughs> um, I remember playing on the playground with um, a girl from China and a girl from Afghanistan whose family had fled uh, Afghanistan around the same time or a few years, maybe two years after me. And so we had similar stories. And I don't know, we just sort of gravitated to each other. We were little kids. We didn't really understand history or anything. But I think like we had an understanding. And then... Um, I, I moved school several times, um, but it seemed like every new school I went to, like the first kids who were nice to me were often the other immigrants. Um, so again, in uh, high school, I walked into science class and I didn't know where to sit, and a girl said, do you want to sit next to me, and smiled really big. It turned out she was from Afghanistan too and had left there as a refugee. I don't know, we keep finding each other. The question over here. Oh, and then this. Okay. Uh, you mentioned something um, that as an immigrant we don't want to talk, but uh, you mentioned when your father uh, just ar arrived here, he didn't feel welcome. Did that fear affect you when you were a child? Um, yeah, yeah, the, well, I don't think I knew everything that was going on, but I definitely could sense when people were unfriendly and didn't like us. Uh, so I think that probably my parents bore the brunt of that, um, but I could feel from them when they were unhappy. I know that's what, what happens, right? Like, things are hard, they affect your parents, your parents are unhappy and then it sort of somehow bleeds into how you feel as a kid. I know my my kid right now is like, I think he's going to remember this time and all of the, the little kids in our family are going to remember this political time as like the time when their parents were always like this. <laughs> so I can't, I can imagine when it was like, you know, even harder for my parents that I think I sensed it. There's a question back there. So um, I have two questions. So the first one is, um, when you uh, when you learn the history from your parent, did you actually like go and do research yourself um, to look into that history? Yeah, yeah. I have a political science background, and 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 I'm a history nerd. So I, it would have been very irresponsible for me to not fact check my father. <laughs> um, But then, like with um, actually with with uh, like casualties in war, especially even if you look that up, you'll find like often four or five different figures, depending on who's doing the reporting, and a lot of it's guesswork. So um, the way that I resolved that was um, 
I would just put his figure, facts and figures inside his speech balloons so that you know it's coming from him, but this is not me saying that this is an indisputable fact. Um, and uh, um, the other question is, um, do you have any recommendation, like other like Vietnamese American author books? Yeah. Um, as far as graphic novels go, um, published, I only know of three. So there's Vietnam America by G.B. Tran, and there's um, a book called Such a Lovely Little War by uh, Marcelino Truong, or Truong, T-R-U-O-N-G. Um, he is half French, half Vietnamese, and his father was a diplomat uh, during the Vietnam War in the early 60s. So, and he was, he's, he's quite a bit older than me, um, so he has a lot of his own memories of that time. Um, their, perspective is, their perspective is a really elite one, because his father was like the South Vietnamese president's favorite translator. But um, what that means is that you get a very, very detailed look into South Vietnam and the politics of the time. So it's, like, it's something that I only, um, you know, kind of gloss over in, in my chapter about the Vietnam War because, as I said in the book, like, my family wasn't any of the pieces on the chessboard. We were just like the ants trying to get out of the way. <laughs> we, were we were normal people, whereas like such a lovely little war will give you more of a perspective into um, like the people who actually were making decisions at the time and what they wanted and what their ideals were. Um, let's see. I haven't read it yet, but I've heard that Bao Ning's uh, The Sorrow of War is a great uh, book to read to get the North Vietnamese perspective. Um, and I'm still looking for for more suggestions to get like the Cambodian and Laotian and Hmong perspective on the same war. I feel like that's that's something that I, I, I didn't know anything about, so I didn't try to do it. But I, it's definitely a missing perspective. What was the last one? Um, it wasn't a book. It was like a my wishful my wish for a book that would deal with the Cambodian and Lao and Hmong perspective. Oh, the sorrow of war. Yeah. Yes. One more. Are you going to write another book? Uh, yes. Um, I, I'm, the next book is about climate change in Vietnam because uh, I learned that Viet, the southern part of Vietnam, the, the, the deep south of Vietnam, the Mekong River Delta is the area that grows half the country's rice and it's going underwater really fast. Uh, so it's going to displace one million people in our lifetimes. And so environmental refugees will be a new thing for the world to think about. Um, in the meantime, the farmers there have to live, right? So they're, they have like the salt water coming in and killing their crop and they don't have things like crop insurance there. So they're having to be very creative. And like uh, when the, the water's too salty, they farm shrimp instead of rice. Um, so this is all very fascinating to me and it feels like sort of science fiction, but it's real. <laughs> so I wanna go there and, and observe the farmers and, and write about it and draw about it and hopefully present it to an international audience to put climate change out there as like not an abstract thing that you can debate, but that's something that like brown people all over the world are dealing with. And it's, um, it's going to affect, it's gonna affect the, uh, the global south first. So um, we in the, the richer countries have the luxury of like, you know, turning it into a political issue and denying it, but um, I'm hoping to sort of get around that by presenting it just as a reality that people are dealing with already. So thank you for coming out today, audience. Um, hi, intermediate students. Let's stick around for just a minute to take a photo, and then T will have a book signing outside. Uh, and let's thank T for coming out here. Thank you so much, everyone.